Thank you, uh, Peter. And uh, happy to be here. We have uh, on, on my left hand, you have uh, Torbjörn. He is the, the chairman and CEO of Gunvor. Jeremy Weir, chairman and CEO of Gunvor. Traffic and Russell, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, <laughs> Trafigura. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You never know, and uh, <laughs> and then and then in, in, a new face, uh, at least on this panel, Russell and uh, Russell is the CEO of Vito, and uh, and, and um, we had for many years we had Ian Taylor here, and fortunately he's not there anymore. But having worked worked very uh, uh, often uh, together with 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 Russell, um, I, I think he's doing a fantastic job in in replacing Ian, and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting panel. Uh, we have a number of, of items we will discuss, um, and, and after that we will also, of course, uh, have interaction, questions from the room, and, and discussions. The main, the main, the first topic I would like to start with is is the the, the attack on on Saudi Arabia, and of course that was was a major attack only a couple of weeks ago. And I would like to hear from each of you, what did you do that day when it happened? You're all running big trading businesses. Um, especially in the region also. And, and what do you think is the impact going forward for supply security, and how do you plan with that? Torbjörn. Well, uh, <clears throat> I've been in the oil industry for many, many, many decades, and, uh, and uh, working for major oil companies. And uh, I think uh, the common uh, thought about something happens in Saudi Arabia, it's a disaster. I mean, that has been hanging over this oil industry. So that Saturday night, uh, looking at the news, see the flames, you thought that uh, this is serious, very serious. And uh, <clears throat> so what we did, obviously, uh, we tried to gather the facts. Uh, and, uh, and on Sunday, we, we, we actually get into the office and talked it through, knowing that there will be a lot of panic in the opening of the exchanges. Uh, the following morning, and because no facts, and that's obviously for that's what drives prices. It's actually the uncertainty. You don't really know, and the fear takes over for action. But they pay. They just get an order, get out, no matter what the price. If you're short, so we know that, and we all know this behavior. And uh, and I think that we talked it through, and obviously, you get a little bit more fact. Is it a short term? problem, or is it a longer term? And I think we felt that it is a short term, whether you can't even define the price. So we, I think we, uh, we, 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 we actually did stay cool, and we decided to stay away from the market uh, the first hours and just wait, wait it out a bit. And, uh, and uh, obviously, the market became more well-informed. And what I think is amazing is that we today is at the, at the, at the low end of, uh, of, of uh, where we were just before. So uh, it seems uh, that there's absolutely no risk premium here, which is somewhat surprising, I think, given the heightened uh, uh, geopolitical risk, because you can't obviously exclude that it's going to happen again. And commodity markets are driven by not what you actually see, but what you expect might happen, and the fear factor is still there. Yeah. So it's not there, and it's, it's quite amazing. Ten years ago, it, it would have reacted uh, with a much more, uh, what we call, risk premium, but Looks is not there. Jeremy. Um, yeah, not wanting to re repeat what Torben said, I think, you know, from our perspective, what do we do? Um, the issue for us is simply about sort of understanding your risk and how you manage that through a crisis, potential crisis like this, because, as Torben said, you don't really know what's going to happen with price otherwise, other than it's going to go up, but how much? And to what extent is it going to be sustainable? And what's the volatility around that? And so therefore, from our perspective, you know, very quickly getting teams to understand uh, what the positions they have in the books, um, what potential opportunities can, can arise and risks can, uh, you're subject to um, through price volatility. And so the teams did all that o over the weekend and then we had the execution uh, teams you know, on the desk, I think at midnight when Asia opened or was about to open, so all prepared to sort of, if you like, understand what, uh, you know, once you've decided your plan around what you want to try and do and achieve and with, the pri with different price action scenarios, Sorry. and then execute that accordingly. And, uh, and I have to sort of say, I think we had something like five times the average volume of turnover of derivatives transactions in that day, to give you an idea, just in our business. But, you know, it, pleasing, you know very pleased it was executed very well and very professionally. So 
Uh, and then, you know, once the, uh, once the, if you like, the very short-term spike occurred and we saw a retra retracement back, then it was sort of business as usual. So that's what we, you know, that's how we, we acted and I, I think uh, very pleased the business, you know, uh, responded very well and very appropriately uh, during that time. Uh, in terms of, you know, your question around sort of forward supply, I think uh, what was, I think it has been very interesting is that I think if you wound the clock back, you know, uh, a number of years, you'd be looking at the, the Straits of Hormuz would be the, the problem area. That's where the focus, this was something which was uh, surprising in terms of by nature. Um, but, on a, but also you would have expected to see, I would have thought, sustained price activity for a period of time. Now, obviously, there was a, a good response from a production point of view. I think what is interesting is that you've got, uh, obviously, you know, the US supply, you've got a difference. There's not the focus on the Middle East as much as it has been. So different forms of supply. Um, strategic stockpiles being held in different countries. So therefore, if you like, the global oil industry, outside of what the Saudis have done from a production point of view, a recovery point of view, but has been able to uh, counterbalance uh, what has occurred. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, just to put a slightly different uh, twist on it, uh, we, have a, we have a large Bahrain office, so, so uh, just in terms of the actual response to the incident, uh, which, which obviously we found out about Saturday morning, Sunday, the Bahrain office is in the office, um, and, uh, and obviously they, they did whatever research they could to try to understand the gravity of the situation, which obviously looked very, very, uh, very, very bad on, on, on Sunday. So the trading teams are very hungry in our, in our, uh, in our offices for information. Um, and, uh, and so Bahrain helped uh, get everybody coordinated and understand the, the, the gravity of the situation. And uh, as, as our traders are very, um, you know, all, all, all very good and very experienced, they, um, you know, a number of them came in the office uh, Sunday. Um, markets opened at 11 p.m. on Sunday evening, and so we could take whatever balancing action that we wanted to do uh, between 11 and 1 on, on uh, Sunday night, actually, because the markets were open. Uh, there was quite a lot of trade at that time of the, of the day because, obviously, the US, uh, US guys were able to trade at that time as well. So we, we were very hands-on, um, and uh, certainly, the, the, certainly our teams did a very good job of understanding the risks and uh, making sure that our businesses were unaffected. Thank you. So why, how, how do you explain, uh, Russell, that this, because this is something which could happen, hopefully not, but tomorrow again, somewhere else, anywhere, how do you explain there is no risk premium? Or maybe it is a risk premium. We talked about it. Maybe the price of oil yeah, is... Yeah, there's high. an $8 risk premium. The price should be 50 today. Yeah. So no. um, I, think, I think most people have the same reflection on the incident, which is that uh, the risk premium vanished uh, pretty radically. Um, and it's, it's a tussle that's going on between geopolitics and the concern over growth uh, in the future, uh, GDP growth in the future, and oil demand growth in the future, and US shale. And those three elements are pulling against each other all the time. And uh, at the moment, concerns over the future are winning. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but the reasons for that are really that the macro sector of the oil industry in the past, hedge funds and uh, pension funds and other investors, they're not really interested in oil. So it's really the sell side that's dominating the, the flows in derivative markets, producers in the US having to, uh, having to be hedged uh, in order to secure returns on capital. And all of that is putting pressure on the oil market and diminishing the risk premium. Thank you. So last night during the dinner, and most of you were at the dinner, we had to fill in a questionnaire. And that was about another uh, supply-driven uh, big phenomena, which is the, the shale. And we were asked, what can derail shale? Is it the geology? Is it finance? Or is it regulation? Or maybe nothing. But that you couldn't fill that in. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I suspect you can, you can argue that a little bit of everything. Uh, obviously, what you weigh price is, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the shale oil industry had defied most prediction of its demise when prices crashed in the first place, shown itself being very innovative, uh, very resilient, 
and uh, and uh, I think that you uh, today it's uh, the, the the productivity gains are still there even perhaps at a slower pace. Uh, however, they are more price sensitive than traditional oil. We know that because of its shorter cycle and it's more on off. So it will respond to prices. There's no doubt about that, in my view. Yeah. Whether it will be a reduction or slower growth, but it is the most price sensitive. So I would say, would it destroy the shale industry? No. But it, I think it will dictate, the, uh, uh, dictate the, 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 the pace of growth, which is still there. And I think this, uh, again, is a, obviously a big dilemma. It's another question for, for, for OPEC and other producers, how to protect a high price enough because you simply allow yeah. big growth. But, and then obviously the regulatory thing, uh, now we're in, in, in a kind of a political minefield. We know that. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, different political forces in the U.S. And, uh, and we'll see. Uh, for now... I think uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, shale industry having uh, good times and uh, it's working well, relatively unrestricted, but it's there. And, and obviously, we haven't seen anything and I, no reason to expect, but obviously, if you see <coughs> contamination of ground waters or things like that, obviously, this will be concerns. But I don't see that. I think if I weigh things, I think it's actually the price. The most. I think the cash is a major issue for investors, I think. But Jeremy. Now, shale production has increased significantly, as we've seen, I think, in 2000. I've got some stats here. 2010, I think the Permian production was a million barrels. I think by the end of this year, it's going to be just under 5 million barrels. There's been enormous investment in, in the industry, both from a financial point of view, but also from a technical point of view. My view is it's here to stay. Um, the investment now moves into sort of has been moving down to pipeline and infrastructure. Now, the, if you like, the pressure point is getting it onto the boats. But ultimately, you know, it's been an incredible, uh, incredible, very short-term history in, in in this industry. Um, in terms of pressure points, uh, you know, I do remember sort of four years ago, you know, shale oil production below seventy-five dollars wasn't possible. Um, you know, we have got, uh, if you like, the major you know, IOCs moving into into the region. Uh, more resilient, I would say, than some of the smaller players. Um, but I do think your point on capital is probably, there's two issues that I would say, you know, price related to capital returns, the investors haven't had the returns uh, in some instances. And therefore, I think that's going to be a major, major issue. And, but I think maybe the, the change in the, in, in the involvement of the IOCs in the region might provide more stability from that perspective. And the other side is the regulatory political environment. Um, obviously, you know, we have to... Sort of, it maybe could be an interesting uh, election next year with obviously different viewpoints associated with that. Um, all of that being said, you know, you have a well-established industry um, and, it's, uh, and I think it's here to stay for a while. Yeah, I think so that regulatory Next point, question, we start with you. So okay. <laughs> I think the regulatory point is a, is a good one. Um, you know, the U.S. Uh, clearly isn't uh, isn't in the same place as Europe today um, in terms of uh, energy transition. So there is there is you know there's a big question mark over what happens uh, if the political winds do change in the states, and that is probably the biggest factor in the future for shale investors. Um, obviously, price has been the short-term factor, and if you look at if you look at the way uh, production has grown. Uh, I think we peaked uh, in terms of growth uh, 17 into 18 at 2.2 additional liquids uh, produced in the, in the US. And really that's dictated by price. And uh, so we're beginning to see the effect of lower prices now. Um, and the early, in the early stage, the, the expectation for 19 going into 20 was up to 2 million barrels a day again of additional growth. I think most people are around 1.1, 1.2 now. So price and therefore returns, returns on capital for those smaller players are clearly going to impact output. Yeah. yeah. Well, we will see. I think also from, from what, what we discussed also, I, uh, like you say, investors have been very disappointed recently. Uh, but that could be a short-term phenomenon. Let's move to, to IMO. And maybe we start with you, Russell. Uh, IMO 2020, it's uh, clean fuels for ship, man, uh, ships, mandatory from 1st of January 2020. So that's in two and a half months. Uh, what do you see? What do you expect? Is, is 
big changes? Yeah, I margins. mean, just to, to set the scene, um, <clears throat> refinery runs this year are running at the same rate as refinery runs last year. So we've made about the same amount of product this year as we made last year, and obviously demand has grown. So we've ended up with very, very tight product markets uh, all, around, all around the world, and in particular, high sulfur fuel oil is extremely tight at the moment. Uh, and ship owners uh, uh, are going out of, uh, out of their way to find high sulfur fuel oil because the markets have been that tight. But we're, we're just approaching the pivot point. Um, demand has uh, just begun to, to shrink. Um, and customers are now beginning to show up and start to buy low sulfur fuel oil. And that's going to accelerate over the next three or four weeks, uh, especially amongst the big ship owners who really want to be as compliant as they possibly can be, have everything tanks cleaned and ready to go uh, by Christmas. So we'll start to see the shift uh, really in the next three or four weeks. Uh, and we're seeing that physically, um, and the market has uh, calmed down a little bit from uh, some extreme backwardation that occurred uh, over, the last, uh, over the last four weeks. So looking forward, we've got runs increasing next year by about 1.3 million barrels a day, which is needed because the market, uh, and it comes back to this financial versus physical point with respect to oil prices, the market's on fumes on, on pretty much all products. You know, we're out of NAFTA's super backward. Is the mic gone? Um, the the, uh, the NAFTA market's backward, the gasoline market's backward, the, uh, the distillate market's backward, and the fuel oil market's extremely backward. We're, we're totally out of products. Um, so it's very bullish for refining margins going into next year. And um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the market's going to be called upon to produce a sufficient quantity of low sulfur fuel oil and gas oil to meet that new demand. On the flip side, there's 2 million barrels of high sulfur fuel oil that... Uh, has to find a place to go, and uh, that remains a big concern of ours, and we can't quite see the solution to that just yet. So, Jeremy. Um, from our perspective, you know, I think let's put also in perspective the, uh, this is probably one of the largest shifts in fuel specifications we've witnessed possibly ever, so it's a, it has a dramatic effect on the industry. I concur with what Russell said. Uh, we expect to see more runs next year. We've got to meet the demand. Um, we expect to see a lot of regional dislocation in terms of just the bunkery market and how you supply the bunkery market with, with different fuel types. Um, we're already seeing a significant uh, dislocation between the distal and, and high sulfur fuel market uh, with spreads uh, between those two rising quite significantly. Um, and then, you know, future industry trends. Um, we think the industry is now looking at supplying much of the new demand with uh, very low sulfur fuel oil. Uh, rather than just going to sort of the marine gas oil market. So anyway, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of dislocation, so, and, and ultimately probably a lot of volatility is here to come. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, as been said here, I think this is one uh, probably when it comes to, for uh, refineries and the markets, one of the most dramatic change and sudden change we've seen. And uh, in fact, the change from uh, high sulfur bunker to low sulfur bunker does have an impact practically on everything which is related to prices from crude oil differentials even to gasoline prices because it will change the way refinery sees their operations. We are operating three refineries we have had uh, in Europe. We have time to study this. And there is, uh, it's a very complex question. Uh, we suspect that refineries uh, will meet this in different ways. Um, and, 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 uh, and uh, it's quite fascinating. And uh, from a very simplistic view, a couple of years ago, where we simply said the differential between high sulfur and uh, gas oil, which will be the nearest uh, substitute, is going to widen. It has widened. But I think it's far more complex than I think. I do believe that the industry will be able, maybe not the next quarter or so, but uh, over a relatively short time, towards the end of next year, would be able to meet the uh, low sulfur uh, uh, demand from bunkers without compromising the distillate yields. I think that's happening. We can see we can do it to some extent without changing much. And why wouldn't any other doing that? So I think, again, 
commodity markets are driven by uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. And uh, as Russell said here, the, 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 the high sulfur fuel market, which is battling two forces, the one of diminishing demand and, and supply, and which one is going first. And it's, it, we have seen trading spreads within a day of $100 a ton because of these two forces. It's just, I've never seen anything like that. And, and it, it is in the end phase. But I think that the industry, the refining industry, will, will be able to meet this. What's interesting is that uh, right now, and, and I think it has to do a little bit with a combination of ships now going in to convert into and install scrubbers, that means uh, of, of, uh, exhaust cleaning equipment on that so they can continue to run high sulfur fuel oil, go into shipyard, and they do that retrofit. And the fact that we had sanctions of, uh, of, 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 of Chinese ship owner Costco has made ship rates actually um, escalate dramatically. I mean, the, the ship rates are extremely high right now. We, we are running a fleet of ships, uh, and we decided here that we were not going to put the scrubber on in December. We're going to do not do that. Uh, why? Because if you go in, it turns out that being in a shipyard takes a bit longer. It's a little bit more complicated than, 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 than first thought. And you stay longer. And if you stay with a, a product tanker, a 50,000 toner or 40,000 ton product tanker, two months, you lose $2 million on that. And that's enough to derail in a market like this. So we decided, you know, doing that, we postpone it to a later stage. So it, all sort of unexpected things are happening here, and, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, I guess it's going to be a, a great deal more chaotic in the first quarter next year. Uh, it's, 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 like you say, it's, it's a very big thing. <coughs> it's a big move where you, the whole industry uh, it has to supply all over the world these clean fuels to ships. And I think it's a good example on how traditional companies, oil and gas companies, are also part of this transition, are making clean fuels for ships. So it's not any more bifurcated as far as I see it. It's not just there is a renewable energy and there's an oil and gas company. No, it's, it's, it's clearly a transition. We'll come back to that later. And it's going to be very interesting to see. And some people will, will and companies will be part of that, and some will not be able to be part of it because it needs big investments, of course. Let's move to, um, to the trade wars and the trade tensions and the impact on, on your business. Maybe to start with you, Russell, what have you seen? What sort of impact have you seen and what do you expect going forward? So, you know, obviously it's, it's weighing heavily on uh, sentiment in the market. Um, demand has uh, outturned at about 750 this year. Uh, 750 increase, uh, which means that it's been steadily coming down. People's forecasts have been steadily coming down all year. If you look at uh, air freight numbers, or if you look at container traffic, or if you look at total trade uh, indices, they're all in poor shape. They're all year on year down. Um, so there is there is a true effect um, that's that's coming as a result of this political uncertainty, um, and it's not it's obviously not very healthy for price. So. We can't, uh, we can't address uh, the causes of some of these, uh, some of these issues. Um, you know, huge amounts of negative yielding debt um, gives, gives, a, gives a signal as to what some of the problems are uh, from an economic context. Um, but the low oil prices that we're seeing at the moment will uh, support a little bit of demand growth um, because that uh, economic equation is fairly fragile from our, from our view. Um, so, you know, very high prices, uh, which is perhaps, again, reflecting on the first question, what happened uh, the Monday after the, the Saudi uh, incident. You know, those, those sorts of sustained high oil prices is something that the world economy probably can't endure at the moment. Um, and that comes back to why we're at $58 today, um, because of that long-term concern with everything to do with the trade war. Um, same as Russell, we're basically, you know, across the whole suite of commodities that we trade, not just in the oil and energy space, but also the minerals and metals space, the trade wars had a damping effect on consumption uh, and therefore on prices, so therefore, and the outlook and sentiment, so the, that, that's not positive at all, uh, and I think that'll continue until we see some form of resolution. Uh, the other thing that's done, though, is rewire some of the 
traditional trade flows. You know, oil was traditionally supposed to go from the US into China. Well, it's not happening anymore, so you're getting barrels pulled to the US and, and with European and WAF barrels and going out to, uh, out to China that route. So therefore, and we're seeing that across a lot of the commodities we trade. Again, not just oil specific, but other commodities. So therefore, we are seeing, if you like, what you consider unnatural commodity flows of, and therefore, and the role of, if you like, I think the three of our companies and others is to try and ensure that the, you know, the supply chain works as efficiently as possible, but it's, it's, it's slightly unnatural at times. Uh, uh, well, obviously, <clears throat> uh, the uh, macroeconomic uh, outlook is, uh, is uh, characterized of a great deal of uncertainty, and obviously trade war is, uh, or not trade war, is, is part of that. I think that, uh, is that the most important factor for the, uh, for the uh, oil industry or where the oil price is today? I, I, I still think that the situation is, uh, is more that we, 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 it's a supply, actually, rather than demand more, even though you can argue whether it's going to be 1 million or 1.2, 1.3. I think the supply is exceeding that, according to our forecast for next year. So, and there's a perception that the oil industry will still will do well uh, at, at lower oil prices. I think uh, we have been in this industry. I mean, we don't remember six, seven years ago, the, the industry needed $90 to break even. Uh, three, four years, two years ago, we talked about $60. And now you talk about $50. And I think it's, uh, and we have, I've heard it here, and, uh, and, and, and this industry is fantastic innovative. The technological breakthrough is really a high-tech industry now, and that drives break-even costs down forward. And fundamentally, I think that's the key question. Then you're going to have fluctuations, and what is that balancing price? To me, it's clear it's going over time, it's going lower rather than higher. And then, obviously, it's exaggerated whether you have a trade war, a recession, or a boom times, and things like that. I think uh, you have to weigh all these things in, and obviously political risk. We are a world, not much spare capacity left uh, in OPEC with uh, Iran not producing, Venezuela is not producing, and there are hot spots all over the place. So, so I mean, it's, uh, it's hard. You have to weigh on all these things in. It's not things. just one, one factor. Okay, let's turn to the, to the energy transition, and we, we try to do it a little bit short, because the, you can talk hours uh, about this, of course. And maybe you can focus, um, uh, so maybe you can focus on opportunities, threats, but also talk about what it means for your banks, your investors, because we've seen statements from banks that they don't want to, uh, in 10 years or five years or 20 years, they don't want to finance fossil fuels anymore. So. That's clearly a threat, but what are the opportunities and how do you think about these, these threats? So we've, we've got a lot of good support from banks and uh, so far no, no, no issues in that regard. Obviously moving the company forward, um, you know, it's very difficult to predict where demand's going to be in 2030, 2040. We've got something like a 20 million barrel a day gap between the forecasters, so uh, it does make it very difficult. So instead of thinking about it that way, we, we, we've, uh, we've looked at this issue uh, and broken it down into four boxes. So uh, transport, which clearly is going to be affected by electric vehicles, uh, electricity, um, hydrogen and carbon capture, and uh, waste and recycling. And then we're doing a little bit in each of those boxes to try to, to, try to, understand, um, try to understand better uh, how that is going to affect our future. So obviously on transport, it's about Biofuels. It's about uh, electric vehicle charging. How do we how do we do some of that through some of our um, uh, daughter companies, uh, some of our marketing uh, outlets? We've got something like seven thousand petrol stations that are part of the group. Um, so how how do we deploy a um, a charging strategy through that? On electricity, wind, solar, and batteries. Um, we're we're in a wind project. We've got a solar business. Uh, and we built, uh, we built some grid batteries here in the UK. Hydrogen and CCS, um, you know, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. Uh, we've, we've just launched a project for our power plant uh, up in the Humber called Humber Zero, um, which, which is essentially a, a project to produce blue hydrogen for the refineries and uh, for use in the, in the power plant uh, at Immigem. 
And on waste and recycling, um, you know, this is really about renewable natural gas, about plastic recycling, that sort of thing. And we've got a few projects in there. So we've, we've probably spent, um, or we've probably committed to spend about $300 million uh, in terms of capex over the next uh, couple of years. And about 200 of that is spent already. So we're just making slow progress. It's, it's still relatively small compared to the size of our other businesses, but, uh, but it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty serious effort in each of those four boxes to, uh, to create uh, you know, a more sustainable future for the company. Um, look, we're also adapting our business for the energy transition. Um, we have a various suite of products. Again, if I look at the, if you like, the minerals and metals side of the business, we're very active in the copper trading business. So obviously, that's very important for electrification. So we're you know, doing continued investments in, in that type of the business and expanding those activities. Uh, nickel intermediates and cobalt, they're, they're very important ingredients from, uh, in battery technology, in particular, the, you know, the lithium-ion batteries. So therefore, expand those activities. Um, we are looking also very much on the power side of the business in terms of solar energy investments, wind renewables, and how they, uh, if you like, the, the, the power utilisation in some of our industrial activities that we have and, in, and also in battery technology. So adapting the business model, if you like, for this energy transition. From a, from a banking perspective, you know, again, like Russell, you know, we're seeing, you know, it isn't impacting on our lines or our business so far, but we are seeing increased interest in this area, you know, we've done some, uh, we've had some, uh, can we go through a sort of ESG review um, and, uh, and, and just working out how we can, if you like, fit the model uh, and make it uh, more and more compliant with the requirements of banks uh, and the pressures that banks have, not just from regulators, but also their shareholders and how they allocate capital to businesses. Well, we, we are, we are uh, um, focusing uh, quite a lot on, on, on the processing of, um, of oil and provide, um, uh, having our refineries to work uh, uh, with a less uh, carbon footprint. So we have a program to see how we can reduce uh, our emissions. <coughs> we're also looking, at, we have uh, acquired a couple of biofuel plants. So we are, um, we are investing in this fair and we, we are also committing or, or, or we haven't taken the final decision yet, but we plan to do invest uh, up to $300 million uh, in our refinery plants just for a new generation of uh, uh, various biofuels. So we do this in combination of uh, um, also uh, make sure that we are, we are, uh, we are reducing uh, the carbon uh, exhaust from our refineries. I, uh, I, I do believe that, uh, uh, and uh, we, we are a strong promoter of gas, because I think that uh, we hear a lot about energy transitions, but I think that any realistic uh, solution is, is to work with uh, natural gas in combination with renewables. Um, and, and, and we see what we can do. We think that carbon capture is, is more promising when it comes to natural gas. And we're thinking about uh, supporting uh, some various uh, startup and uh, early initiatives uh, for this. OK, thank you. Um, before we, we open it up to the floor, we, we, that's a traditional uh, last question for the panel about the oil price next year. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you look back on what was said last year, there was a big, big range. So from what I thought was very low to, uh, to, to a high. And your colleague Ian Taylor clearly was the winner. He was very low. I, I, I thought, how could he be so low in price? But see, see what happened. But, but let's see what, we, what you think one year, the next, the next uh, Energy Intelligence Forum. Uh, Russell. So the prediction for... Prediction for... 2020, Energy Intelligence I, uh, Forum. I, I'm day. a trader, so I need, I need to know whether you're talking about the average, the high, or the low? The day. The day. The, day, the close of the day. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, we, we, without, without some of the resolutions to... Um, uh, to the trade wars, then, then we are we remain a little bit bearish. So, uh, a five handle for us. A five handle. Um, bearish in the short term, I think the sentiment is not good with the, particularly with the, the current trade environment, and the strong U.S. dollar, which is you know how long that's going to stay, I don't know. But uh, I would say you know there's further downside in the short term. Recovery possibly towards this you know in the fourth quarter of next year or second half of next year. So. 
I would be on Russell's side probably with a five handle and maybe slightly lower from where we are now. Okay. Well, Dorby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I think the market is, uh, is uh, obviously going to be volatile, so we're going to see higher prices than we see today, and we possibly see lower prices today. And the lower prices, I think, the market would like to test OPEX resolve during the course of next year, at one point or another, uh, because I do believe that uh, it is not enough just to maintain the production. It's just a bit too much slippage inside, and there's so much non-OPEC production coming. So they need to do something. And I think it depends on that resolve. I, I, I don't think that the market will, will, will trade higher. I think it's some other long-term factors that keep us under control. So I would say, I would hedge, I think we will actually be back to the same levels we see today, but a lot, some swings in between. Okay. Well, we'll see you next year. Um, questions? Thank you, panel. Uh, my name is Larry Marks. I'm an energy consultant from Canada. Uh, I want to get a sense for the International Maritime Fleet's reaction to IMO 2020. And uh, what percentage of the total fleet do you think will elect to install scrubbers versus the low sulfur fuel oil? So I think there's about 4,000 ships booked in for scrubbers at the moment. Um, Quite a lot of those are big owners, um, so I think that's about a third of demand. But it's taking time, right? The, the ships are all queuing outside China to get the to get the the work done, which is contributing to the shipping tightness. Um, and certainly, some of our customers, some shipping uh, container lines, are not expecting to get that job done until the end of 2021 because there's a big big queue to get into the yards. Dave Sturgis, Woodside. Thanks for all your uh, good insights on the oil market. I was wondering if we can touch on LNG. So with LNG commoditizing in this early phase, what are some of the lessons you have learned in trading LNG recently? Thanks. I would like to take that. Here we go. Here you go. Um, look, first of all, fr from our point of view, LNG has become much more of a commodity. Um, there's a lot more, a uh, long way to go. Uh, in that business, um, and, the, and the, if you like, the pricing availability in the futures markets are developing in that marketplace. So, I think it's a, it's a very exciting market. It's one which we're all involved in, and I think there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, but what we are seeing is very much a commoditized market uh, on a forward-looking basis. And if I may, yeah, may add to that, it's clearly like that. We think that uh, the LNG has come a long way from a producer to end user. Uh, market to oil link pricing. Some of them negotiated decades ago. It's clearly out of phase with spot realities. As a response to that, we see, uh, we see the market and uh, the, the buyers are now acting like what you would expect them to do, have some long term and also some short term. So the spot market is uh, constantly growing. There are several indexes uh, out there, Henry Hub, European, the two of them, and, uh, and obviously the uh, Japan-Korea index. So clearly, it is moving in the, in the, in the end of commoditization. And it actually, it's a lot of uh, arbitrage business going here, or particularly from the US, which is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it works to the Asia, sometimes to Europe, and so forth. So all of a sudden, the LNG is actually linked into more to what's happening on the European continent than it ever been before. So it's an exciting development, and, 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 and we are, we are moving, uh, moving, obviously, ahead in this. Anything to add, Russell? Well, I think the, the lesson learned is don't leave your LNG carrier on demurrage, because it's $200,000 a day. <laughs> the rate cost. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Jordan from VTTI. Um, my question is to do with IMO, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the impact of IMO on the flow, the traditional flow of fuel oil around the world, if any. Uh, I think Europe, uh, if you start with Europe, uh, there's 
two co I mean, Europe is, has all traditionally been very long high sulfur uh, fuel oil, it, because of, mainly because of the flu out of Russia, which is substantial. As you know, they, 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 their refineries are not that sophisticated, and they produce a lot of fuel oil that needs to be exported. So Europe is exporting this fuel oil. So the big question is that, uh, is that, that question, is that flow continue? And I suspect it will do. But I think uh, we already see today that it's going to be in a, it's a cheap enough, it's going to be an attract. I think that fuel oil will not go into the banker market, it will go into uh, upgrading units, particularly into the US, into the cokers and so forth. And I think uh, US refiners will adapt to this and perhaps run more of their own crude oil <laughs> complemented with this high sulfur fuel oil. So we'll find other markets, that part of it. What is produced is still going to be a surplus of, of, of some of the fuel oils, but again, about the price. We have more sweet crude oils, and refiners will, will change their slates. We, we already now see a shortage of fuel oil. Yes, the, the bank of demand is there, but it's, it's clearly less supply. And I think this is a process that will work its way well through, uh, some of the less upgraded uh, fuel oils will move into cokers and uh, other upgrading units. Other questions? Is it on? Okay. Uh, hi, Franz Koster with Energy Intelligence. Uh, Mr. Hardy, I believe that you had mentioned early on in the panel uh, that hedge funds are sort of exiting oil. There's not a lot of appetite for it. I'm wondering whether the panel sees this as sort of a general risk off or if it's something particular to oil uh, and if the latter, why? Thank you. So I think it is something in particular to oil. Um, Obviously, hedge fund performance hasn't been hasn't been terrific over the last few years, and I'm I'm not really reflecting on the last year. This is this is sort of a decade on decade thing, whereby there's just there's just a lot less interest in energy markets, unfortunately, on a go forward basis from uh, from the investors' side. You know, you see that with equities, um, and uh, you see that with pension funds and and hedge funds. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a very general comment. I'd agree with that. The, what I would say, though, you, start, you still see a lot of interest in the algorithmic trading uh, on, on the various platforms. I mean, system-based orders are a huge part of what's uh, executed across all commodity exchanges. And so, therefore, yes, you're seeing less on the particular hedge funds, but I think you are seeing an uptick on, on algo-type trading, which, uh, which pr still provides good liquidity on the marketplace. We have time for one more question. No questions? Alex. Thanks, Thanks guys. Alex Schindler, Energy Intelligence. Um, Marcel asks, what's the price next year? But I think in the context of the session this morning with Saudi Arabia, we're talking more about uh, what's the price going to be in five years. Uh, are, are we going to be in a sort of low oil price environment or, or a high oil price environment? Because what uh, I mean, Nasser said this morning was that under some of the scenarios that, he, that they're looking at, you know, Saudi Aramco may have to produce 15 million barrels a day, even under you know a scenario where global oil demand is around 70 million barrels a day or something like this, where the low cost producer has to produce. But the question is, what is the price when Saudi Arabia has to produce 16 million barrels a day when demand is, is sort of 70 million barrels a day globally? So. Maybe a uh, poll of the panel on five years. What's, well, what's the price yeah, look like? Okay. Well, I, 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 it's an interesting question. I think it comes back to uh, obviously uh, a little bit on, on, uh, on uh, uh, the desire to invest for the long term. Uncertainty means obviously you put off uh, investment for very long term projects. And I think that is a concern for the industry how to finance these things, whether it, you get your money back 10 years. And, and, and I, even though it's very easy to be caught up in, in short-term thinking here, uh, a little bit doom and gloom, but the oil industry has always been like that. And this is not the last cycle we see. And I wouldn't be surprised to see five years from now we could see the oil prices as a response to some underinvestments which hits the market five years from now that we could see considerably higher prices. It's cyclical, and it hasn't stopped. Uh, I would agree with that. Five years from now. 
five years is a long time, but uh, I would agree with that in, in the fact that you're, let's say we start to see a recovery back end of next year um, into uh, 21. Um, we have to have investment in the industry. Um, is that investment going to be there? And you're going to have to have a reasonable price for that investment to take place. We, we talked earlier about uh, you know, the poor returns for some investors in the Permian. So therefore, I would expect to, you know, for that to be encouraged, you would need a higher price. So I think I'd, I'd flip the question around the other way and say, you know, we're just at the beginning of an S-curve on, on demand. So what do you think about, what will you be driving in five years' time would be my question. And then, I, then you can answer that question. You've really got to understand where transport demand is going over the next five to ten years. Uh, to to see what type of cycle, whether we, whether we do have the potential for a, a long-term bearish cycle. I mean, I, the jury's out. You, you can't make that conclusion yet because the rate of change on, on the demand side uh, is, is noticeable, but it's not really noticeable. Uh, it's still very, very modest. And so we're just at the beginning of that S-curve, and you've got to try to work out whether that's five years, 10 years, or 15 years in order to, to think about these long-term prices. So, Russell, put a price on it. 100. Sound good? <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy? 70. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. Easily can be 70, but I think Russ is right, obviously. I, 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 but I do believe that uh, it's going to be... The energy transition will take a bit longer. That's my take of it than people generally think. It's a complex thing, and oil demand will continue to grow. It's not just that additional supply that has to fill. It also has to replace what's been done. And, 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 and that's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of capital. And, uh, and what we do today will set, obviously, tomorrow. If we don't invest today, the price will be higher tomorrow. That's my view. So your price was? I would say that five years from now, whether it's five or four, five, six, yeah, we see 70 $80, maybe, temporarily at least. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Thank you.